All right, before we do anything, just a couple of, a little bit of information real quick. Just since we're always, uh, sometimes I do this, I haven't done it in a while, but, you know, we, because we're here in a little small church in the middle of nowhere, I know sometimes it can feel like, well, what are we really doing? Are we really accomplishing anything? But just to let you know, just this week, uh, our podcasts have now shown up on one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different podcasting charts. We're on uh, the chart uh, globally for all podcasts. We are on the chart for uh, podcasts for uh, all podcasts in the United States. We're on the chart for uh, the religion and spirituality chart for global podcast. We are on the uh, podcast for global news. We're on the podcast chart for USA religion and spirituality. We're on the podcast chart for USA news uh, ch- chart. And we're on the chart for podcast in Canada all podcast. And as of this morning, we now rank above 3,029,728 podcasts globally. So we're now in the, we're in the top 10% of all podcasts in the, in the world. So I know we feel like we're just doing, we feel like we're doing nothing, but we always are accomplishing something there. Yeah, do I wish it would translate here? <laughs> you get, but um, you know, it, it, but you can't, you know. Yeah, Pe- put it this way: people in Texas don't like me. That's all I know. Okay, other states they love me. Okay, so um, maybe I just ended up at the wrong in the wrong place. I don't know, but but you know what? I don't think I ended up in the wrong place because if I was in any other church, I wouldn't be able to do the way we do things here. And the way we do things here is a lot of the reason people listen to us online because we're not like because other churches you know I wouldn't be able to do the things we do I would be gone I mean I mean they would I wouldn't I wouldn't survive 15 minutes you can't challenge question and struggle and deal with the things that we deal with so I'm glad that we are so in a roundabout way it works out great right maybe in a small place here but I get the freedom to deal with the things that we deal with which then other people get to benefit from. So I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for it in that way because I'm telling you, any other church, it would not, it would be, I would be finished. All right, so just so that you know, that's what's happening there with the podcast. It's, it's always good, but now let's get to work. Everybody ready? All right. For the Bible study exercise for the podcast, we're in the middle of a seven-week study on the subject of discernment, which we have talked about here at church. We've been working on this subject of discernment, and today we're going to kind of, we're going to see where we take this, but there's a lot of things I want us to consider. So I want you to write down the following words, all right? And if you listened to the broadcast last night, you know, I gave these words, but I want you to have them down, all right? So I want you to write down the word discernment, discernment, I want you to write down the word conviction, Conviction. I want you to write down the word faith. And then write down the word character. Discernment. Conviction. Faith. Character. All right, now, the curriculum for the Bible study exercise for this seven weeks has a specific agenda in mind. And this specific agenda is a perfect opportunity for us to divide Christianity really into two very different camps. Over in the one camp, it's very few people, (laughs) all right? It's in the minority of the minority of the minority. The other camp is the way most Christians think and how most Christians operate. And so it's a stark contrast. I want you to help understand this contrast, all right? So let's do this. As a Christian, even as a non-Christian, but we'll focus as Christians, as Christians, you have to make decisions, do you not? About what to do, like what house to buy, what job to get, who to marry, who to date, who to break up with, right? What this, that, I mean, there's, there's a million decisions. Everyone has those decisions, right? 
Okay, for the Christian to make those decisions and to be able to make judgments about what is right and what is wrong, what I should do, what I shouldn't do, that ability to make this discernment, this ability to see, we refer to as discernment. Discernment. Now, in the life of many Christians, this process of discernment is a very subjective, mystical kind of supernatural feeling kind of thing that you try to do, right? You're like, okay, I'll pray about it and then I'll get a feeling or they will say something like, God spoke to me, God said this to me, this is, God told me this is who I should marry, God told me this is who I should, like God will come involved in this, but God is somehow communicating with them outside of scripture, right? Right? And they use this whole criteria and how to discern, right? So the curriculum kind of creates this. uh, This is the way the curriculum wants us to go, all right? Here's how discernment works. Discernment, first of all, is based off God's word. That sounds good. That sounds good, right? And in the curriculum, they looked at Genesis 3 to try to prove this point, right? Because God spoke to Eve And she did not listen to God's word. She was, something else influenced her. And we talked about that discernment, did we not? And that sounds great, right? God's word, for the Christian, God's word, everyone agrees to some level that God's word plays a part in it. Every Christian admits that, right? So there's agreement there. But the curriculum then wants to bring in these other words. Conviction, faith, and character. This is what they say. Yes, you look to God's word, but sometimes you need more, right? You got to be able to, to figure this out. So, when you make your choice, does it, make, does it lead to a conviction? Do you feel convicted by it? Well, if you feel convicted by it, it must be wrong. Now, does that sound like good advice? Some of you may think it sounds like good advice, but there's some possible problems with that. What are some possible problems with that? What do you think some possible problems with that? What do you think? Oh, okay, very good. Conviction is based off a feeling, right? Feelings can change. You may be convicted about it today, right? Right? You may be convicted that, you know, I am convicted that I should not date an unbeliever until you like, oh, that's the unbeliever? Right? The feelings change. Not to make light of it, but I mean, come on. Things change. What, what's another problem with it? So feelings change. What's another problem with it? That maybe you're being convicted by something that has nothing to do with Scripture, but based off culture how you were raised. Because we do know this, Christianity is famous for adding a lot of rules that may or may not have anything to do with this. So is my conviction coming from God's word? Say, you see where I'm going to, you see where I'm going to try to, you see, you're starting to see the two camps emerge. I haven't really explained this one yet, but I think you can see where I'm going. This one adds to God's word, right? And there's all these other things. So, okay, I know what God's word says, but do I feel, if I feel convicted by it, then don't do it. Or if I don't feel conviction, do it. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's some possible problems with this, right? Some major problems with this. Because I can't always trust my conviction. I can feel convicted when I shouldn't feel convicted. And I may not feel convicted when... I should be convicted. Uh, Maybe I'm the only one. All right. Now, how does the faith thing work? Well, this camp says, does it require faith? Now, how does this work? This is like, well, I got two decisions to make. The one that requires the most faith, the one that requires me to trust God the most, has to be the right decision. Well, wait a minute. That sounds ultra spiritual. But wait a minute. There's some major issues here, right? 
I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, and, I, and I talked about this on the podcast. When I was in Nebraska, my first Bible Institute, right? I think almost every person in that Bible Institute was, had been in the military and they all got out of the military. Why did they get out of the military? Because it was this mentality that, no, 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 no. Staying in the military, having that secure paycheck, having all of your benefits, that doesn't require faith. Get out of the military and then be a part of the Bible Institute. And then one day you'll get in ministry, right? Show your faith in God. I was like, you people out of your mind. And they were like, you're weak. You don't have enough faith. You want to rely on the government for security. You won't trust God. Well, out of all the people in that class, I think only two of us made it into the ministry. And I'm one of them. The others ended up having to get two and three jobs to support their families. But they made the decision that required supposedly faith. And I'm like, so wait a minute. I'm, I'm going to have faith that God will provide me a job by throwing away the job that he's already provided. You see, how, you see how subjective all of that becomes? And I've seen people make really crazy decisions there. This requires, that's got to be the right decision. I'm like, I don't know if that's the way the decision should be made. Okay? That's it. Well, there, there was a little bit of group thing going on, but it was this, but it was ultra, make it spiritual. Y'all been an independent fundamental Baptist? Remember faith promise mi- missions every year? How does that work? How, how does faith promise missions work? You promise to give $500 a month to missions, even if you don't have it, even if you can't afford it. And guess what you pay first? You pay the missions first, okay, and the tithe, on top of the tithe, and even if you have to use a credit card, even if you have to go in debt, because you're going to trust God. Now, the only person that benefited is the people getting your money, and they they would always say, pray about it, but just make sure you pick a number that's going to require faith. Oh, man, I've seen that manipulation over and over. That's some messed up stuff going down right there. That is some messed up. And I watched some people utterly hurt themselves financially because of that. Hurt their family. And they usually, they usually would bring someone in to preach it, and then that person split town. The pastor wouldn't preach it because then everybody would get mad at him. Right? But have some other person, and then he... Uh, that's some messed up stuff. Yeah, you've experienced it. David, I've experienced it. If you haven't experienced it, thank goodness you have it. Because there's a lot of guilt getting heaped upon, upon you. You've got to participate. But it requires faith. And then the other one is character. And what they mean by that, does it agree with God's character? Again, all of these sound, there's an essence of spirituality to it, Right? Mary's trying to make a decision. It's like, hey, hey, Mary, what does God's word say? Hey, what are you? Con- what's your, where's your conviction lie? Hey, which requires more faith? Hey, does it agree with God's character? That all sounds super spiritual, but it becomes very what? What's the word? Subjective. Oh, that's the word of the day. Subjective is bad. That's this camp. That's most Christians. And and they may add other things to it, right? Do I feel a sense of, what's another one? Oh, come on. Peace. Oh, I have a sense of peace. Do I feel a sense of peace? That's a feeling. That's a feeling. Yes? All right. They may throw other things. A sign. Did God give me a sign? Did he open a door or close the door? A sign. Right? Okay, I, I can go on and on and on and on. All of these things. And, and you've heard it. Or, or I, I heard God speak to me in some way, shape, or form. This all becomes this subjective thing. And so Christians are running around trying to make decisions. And sometimes you're just like, what is going on? And guess what? Sometimes those decisions that supposedly are made because of all of these things were met end up blowing up and falling apart. 
This is the person God told me to marry. And then you ended up divorced. This is the person God told you, uh, God told you to go to the mission field. And three years later, your family's blown up. And uh, it's all, I don't know if you were supposed to go on the mission field. Told you to move here. I've seen, oh man, in the military, I saw that all the time. God all of a sudden is telling people they needed to move all the time. You know, and it's usually about two or three years. And, and sometimes it was always, you know, some other interesting location. It was always the way it worked out. And I've watched many of them leave, go. And then when they get there, no longer going to church, marriage falls apart. I'm like, yeah, yeah I'm so glad you listened to God tell you to move. Those are very subjective things, right? And, and instead of just being honest, what, what, what should we just say? I want to move! <laughs> That's okay. It's okay to say, this is what I want to do. So when it comes to a Christian, how do we discern? How do we make a decision? How does it work? Right? So I'm going to try to take what the curriculum is trying to do to create this very subjective mess. And the curriculum for this seven weeks was written by the guy who wrote the book, Experiencing God, which you know how I loathe that book. Loathe that with every ounce of my being. It's, oh, yeah, I, oh, I, don't, I don't ever want to burn any books, but I may burn that one, okay? I can't stand that book, okay? But that's a whole different subject. I'll just stay calm and not go on a full-blown rant, okay? But I do get really angry and mad at this weird thing that Christians get put under. Like, because you're trying to figure it out. I remember when I was a Christian teenager, trying to like, okay, so how am I supposed to make these decisions? Like, okay, what? Is it a feeling? Okay, what's going on? Do I lay on the floor? Like, what do I do? Do I eat pizza at midnight? Like, what happens? Do I look in the lights until things start flying? Like, what do I do? Do I run and smash into a wall until I get, what, what ha- And I could, I mean, I made all kinds of weird, messed up decisions. Like, like, okay, this, okay, wait, this, Wait, no, yeah, like I, wait, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And, and nobody could ever give good advice. It was always this weird subjective stuff. So I reject all of this camp, all of it. Outright, crazy, cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, broken, messed up, no. My view is much more simple, but a lot of people don't like it. All right, here's how it works. I'm going to try to take you through a, a kind of a flow chart. You ready? All right. It starts with God's word. It starts with God's word. Now, you know what's required? Detailed study all the time and proper understanding and proper interpretation. Okay? Or you could say it requires proper hermeneutics, right? Got to know how to read it. Got to know how to understand it. Got to know how to interpret it. I got to know when to apply it, when not to apply it. Because some people will use God's word for this discernment stuff, right? You know, I, again, I've given you the story before. A woman I worked with, her and her husband couldn't have a baby. She was very bothered. She was very upset. She was broken. She couldn't handle it. She didn't know what to do. What was God going to do? And then for her morning devotions, she's in Genesis, and God promises Abram and Sarah a baby. All of a sudden... God was promising her a baby, and I was like, your husband's name's not Abraham, and you're not Sarah. It's not kept working. That promise is not for you. So you got to know how to understand it. So it starts with a proper understanding of God's word. It, that's required. you got to know how to handle it, how to read it, how to interpret it. And then guess you make your decisions then on what God addresses in regards to that decision what God says about it, or what principles would be applicable to it. This is how it should work. It should be God's word. This is where it begins, and this is really where it ends. But let me try to explain how this works, okay? I want to get into some of this, but I want to make sure we understand this, because if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you've struggled with some of these concepts and how to make this work. So let me try to explain this. All right. Does God's, does, God, does God's word address every single issue that you're ever going to deal with? No, it would be crazy. Does it tell you what house to buy? No. Tell you where to move? No. Right? It does, there's all the, who to date? Now, there may be principles. Understand there may be principles, but it's not going to be specific, is it? 
All right? So the best we can do is, this is what, whatever the issue is, first of all, and I'll just kind of help you walk through this, the first thing you need to establish is, does God's word address it directly? Does God's word address it directly? Certain things it will address directly, right? It's Friday night. Do I go out and get drunk? Does God's word, does God's word address that directly? Yes, because the Bible condemns drunkenness, right? So that takes care of that problem, right? Doesn't mean you can't go out. It just means it addresses what you can do when you go out, right? You can't get drunk. That's specifically, that's like, that's clear. Like it doesn't require seminary, Bible college, doesn't even require much hermeneutics, right? Do not get drunk. Drunkenness is a sin, yes? All right. I think that's clear. Oh, I'm going to go out on Friday night. I'll give an example. All right, so I'm with my mom, okay, when she was alive. I mean, very young. We're on North First, or South, South First, Abilene, Texas, right? And we, you know the big Ford dealership there at the end of South First? They had a gigantic American flag. Huge. It's like the size of a small city. And my mom pulls over and says, we're going to steal it. So we pull over, and there's me. I'm, I'm little trying to pull the, trying to troll and pull the flag down. I got the flag. I can't see. I'm running into cars, right? And I'm trying to get it. The thing takes up like the whole back seat, and we steal the flag. Okay, okay, right? I mean, it's a long time. I'm, I'm, statue of limitations has to be over by now. Okay, all right, okay. And I don't know what we did with the flag, but so we stole the flag. All right, that's kind of fun but the Bible would address said activity. Yes. Right. Why? Thou shall not... Okay. That's simple, right? It addresses the issue, right? Now, it may have felt fun, right? I mean, the thing was like 15 times. I'm like, yeah, it's gigantic. I mean, you've seen some of those gigantic American flags. I mean, it was like, it was crazy. Like, I'm in the back seat suffocating under a flag, right? <laughs> but we got the flag. Okay, and there was no security cameras back then, so we're good to go. Okay, right? And, and, and my name is Stephen Dantzler, for anyone listening online. Okay, All right? I live near, yeah, I, I can give you the address and everything. Find K Texas News, okay? You can bring the news crew to his house and ask him why he stole the flag. Okay, all right. But that's addressed. Correct. Correct. Okay. There are other, so you get the idea. Is it addressed directly? Now, it may not be specifically about you and you going out, but there's a clear principle that's addressed. That's simple. Now, it, it's simple, but it's not easy. Why is it not easy? Because I have a sinful nature, right? So just being able to discern what it says doesn't guarantee that I'm going to do it. Eve knew what the scripture said, or what God said, right? Didn't matter. We talked about that, right? But in the meantime, I just want you to figure out, does the word of God address it directly? All right. What's second? What would be second in, in, in discerning? Well, we got to figure out God's word and then we have to figure out, does God's word address the issue directly? What would be the second thing to look for? Okay. Is there a principle that applies to the situation? Is there a principle that would apply to the situation? Now, that's not always easy, right? Is that always easy? <clears throat> Typically, you're going to look for something that's addressed directly, but at least a general principle that's involved. Yes? Now, that may require a little bit of work, and that can be, and if you've got to be careful, because that can get a little subjective. But you just look, are there any general principles involved in this situation or the scriptures that would give me some kind of idea? <laughs> Do I? Like I <laughs> well, I'm not going to go. Well, that would probably deal with committing a crime or doing something wrong. Say so that would be more directly. Say, like, finding the ones where it would just be a principle applied is a little bit more subjective. It's not an easy one to kind of figure out, right? Okay. 
Okay, there's a general principle to obey civil laws. Yes. Right. Okay, right. So that, that could be a possible uh, applicable. Yes. All right. Because, I mean, we are told to obey the laws that are placed over us. Yes. Romans 13 makes it clear. First Peter. There's other passages. So that's a general principle. Now, people may struggle on should I or shouldn't I, but there's at least a general principle to deal with, right? Does that make sense? They may not give us, because I mean, we saw that in the COVID situation. I mean, Christians argued and fought all day. We, 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 and so people tried to change what Romans 13 actually meant, and, tried, and people had the debate. But there was a principle there we had to struggle with, yes? Was it going to give us specific details for our specific situation? No, because the scriptures are just kind of clear, right? Every, every authority is put there by whom? God. To resist that authority is to resist whom? God. We are to submit to it. For a good example, Bobby and I, I think, agree on this. We both hate seatbelts. I loathe them. I can't stand seatbelts. Who created a seatbelt? They're insane. Why? Okay? Don't like seatbelts. I have my own personal reasons for it because it was on this highway coming from the direction from Winters to Jim Ned one morning trying to get to school. My girlfriend's driving. We're doing like 90. We're running way late. And all of a sudden, a deer the size of a semi truck comes boom, 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 bouncing on the road, boom, boom, crashes into the windshield. The whole front of the car gets pushed down. I get kicked in the face by the deer, knocked unconscious. I'm laying on the floor bleeding. I don't have my seatbelt on. I'm on the floorboard bleeding. She's like, he's dead, he's dead, he's dead, right? And I have to go to the hospital in winters, and it's all bad. And then the cops come out, and they're like, man. If you'd have had your seatbelt on, you'd have been dead. Because the whole front of the car got crushed all the way down. But I'm still giving you a ticket. I'm like, what is this nonsense? I would be dead. He's giving me a a ticket. I don't like seatbelts, right? I don't like them. Because it's like, I pay for the car. I pay for the insurance. and Because I've got to have a seatbelt on when someone rides by on a motorcycle. And I always yell at them, put on your seatbelt! And it... Look, why, why can't you ride a motorcycle, but I have to have a seatbelt on? Now, I think if you, kids should have to wear them because they can't make the decision, right, for themselves. But, you know, if I go through the windshield and die, that's on whom? That's on me, right? That's on me. So I just don't like it for the principle that I should be able to make that freedom since I'm paying for the car and I'm paying for the insurance, right? If you make me pay for the car and pay for the insurance, I should be able to do something that I want to do in the car. And it doesn't hurt anybody else. Does that make sense? So that's, I mean, whether you agree or disagree, you get the idea, right? So that's, that's something I don't like. Now, does scriptures tell me what to do? The general principle is I'm supposed to. So guess what I do? Click it so I don't get a ticket, right? Okay. All right. Whatever a dumb commercial is, right? I do so. I, not, that I, not that I want to. Right? Not that I want to, but I do. So one, because I don't want a ticket, but I'm supposed to do that for the, what the scriptures say. It's a general principle. Now, whether you agree or disagree with me, that's irrelevant. That's not the point here to get into an argument about seatbelts. But the point is, there's a principle there. Yes? So does scripture address it directly? Number two? Is there a general principle? And we've got to be honest with those principles. Right? And what's the biggest problem with one and two? What's the biggest problem with one and two? We're involved, right? So what do we have a tendency to try to do? If we don't like it, change it. That's hard. And justify, right? It's hard to do. Because what three things motivates us? Go to Genesis 3 really quick. We talked about this. There are three things that fight against these two principles. Genesis chapter 3. Eve's having the discussion with the serpent slash Satan. They go back and forth. Finally, she looks at the tree that she's not supposed to have. And look at verse 6. And the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof, did eat, gave also unto her husband. Why couldn't she just left him alone? And with her, and he did eat. Three things that get in the way of this is 
We are motivated by what we see, by what we feel, and by our pride, our self. What we see, what we feel, and our pride, because we want, we want what we want, right? Yes? I mean, get into any argument about should you or shouldn't you do this, someone's going to possibly, they may not say it the exact way, but they're going to talk about, well, how they perceive it, right? They're going to talk about how they perceive the situation. They're going to talk about how they feel, and then in the middle of all of that, it's going to be about what? Them. It's going to be about them. That gets in the way of our discernment. Our discernment is always challenged by these three things. What I see, what I feel, and my own self-interest, my own pride. But we have, to, we have to set that aside to go, does God's, word address, does God's word address it directly? Does God's word provide a principle that could relate to it? And that, that you have to at least decide that. Now, guess what you, you may end up figuring out? I can't do what I want to do. Or you may decide, I'm going to do it. What I think, what I would prefer is I wish discernment would lead to right action, but it doesn't. The best we can do is just be honest. Like, just don't make any excuse. I'm doing this, and whether it's right or wrong, I'm doing it. And I'm just going to acknowledge it. People say, well, that's horrible. It's better than pretending. Right? All right? So, we've got God's word. Does it address it? Is there a principle that applies to it? What would be third in for a Christian trying to discern? What do you think is th- Third. Well, see, now we start getting to subjective. All right, I think at this point, we've got all after, after that, then guess what are the rest of our decisions are based off of? It's based off just basic things like, you know, what's logical, what makes the most sense, what's the most feasible, like just a lot of, all the other factors come into play. And you can't pretend that those other factors don't come into play. Right? You can't say all these factors don't come into play. Right? The Bi- I'll put it this way. The Bible doesn't tell you who to marry. Now, I know Christians have this mindset that God has one person there waiting for you, and you just got to find the right person, and this becomes all kind of a subjective thing. What does the Bible give you? It gives you a ge- basically a general principle. It kind of addresses it directly a little bit. And what's, that, that, what's the rule? Do not marry an unbeliever. Now, depending, we could get into a whole argument about divorce and remarriage. Some would say, if you're, you can't get remarried, if you're divorced, so we could have that whole issue. So there would be other issues we'd have to talk about. But the bottom line is, the most clear one, where there's very no dispute, do not be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. Outside of that, does it get any more specific? So what are you going to be basing the rest of your decisions on? common, like, attraction, they're going to be those basic issues. Yes? Right? When it comes to moving, does God's word address this in any specific way? There may be some general principles, right? Obviously, you don't want to make a decision that would be negative to you spiritually, right? I mean, that's a general principle, right? But see, praying about your motives becomes what? Subjective. Right. Right. I mean, I think you need to address, I need you look at your motives. Like, why do I want to do this? Like, why do I want to do this? And what are the possible negative consequences of doing it? But I'm thinking, at this point, you're just, you're going to rely on just all of this other stuff. You're going to rely on all of this other stuff. And, and people act like, well, that's not very spiritual. But it's just the reality. Right? Which car to buy? Now, some people will say, I prayed about it and got peace over the green. Well, what are you talking about, okay? You're out of your mind. It doesn't work that way. So what should, what should be your considerations on what car to buy? Well, can you afford it would be a good place to start. Okay? You can tell the teenager, does it run good? No, I don't care about the price, okay? Right? 
or Kate would be, what color is it? Okay, right? Okay, but, but you get the idea. Can I afford it? That's a good place to start, right? Okay. Obviously, if you're, you may be looking at uh, reviews to see which cars are rated higher for safety or for reliability. Like you're just going to, you're just doing your basic kind of stuff, right? That's the way it works. And, and, and people try to act like Christians. We don't operate in that world. We walk around in the supernatural. You walk around in cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, I don't know what you're doing. That's just crazy talk. This is just the way you try to f- figure it out. We figure out, does God's word address it directly? Or there's a principle? And there can be principles in all of these. Please understand, there can be principles. You just got to make sure you're, you're not making a principle where there isn't one. Right? Because remember, that's the whole Pharisees and the Sadducees adding to God's word, right? Adding. Remember, they added all those rules to the Ten Commandments? Were their motivations right? I think their motivations were good. What were they trying to protect? They were trying to protect people from breaking the law. But they made 900 rules that made you guilty of something that wasn't anything to do with the law. You can't do that. And then the rest, we're just making, what what do we call this third one? Just using basic common sense decision-making techniques, right? that, that, That sounds horrible to say that in the church, but it requires that. I mean, you think all of the things through and making good decisions. Right? You may give it some time. You think about this. You think about that. Is the information you're relying on, is it accurate? Is it truthful? I mean, just basic things. You don't be relying on crazy conspiracy theories. You factual information to the best of your ability to make the best decision you can with a willingness to admit that you are possibly wrong and change course if need be. It's sad that you have to say that in church, but that, that's, that's the way it works. Is it addressed directly? Is there a principle? And then the rest, you just make good decision-making techniques that sometimes I feel like people aren't really trained in how to make good decision-making te- techniques. Maybe sometimes I think Christianity messes up our ability to make good decisions. Now, we do know what will, what's always a major issue as far as the spirituality of our decision-making process, we have to acknowledge it, is our sin nature is a constant struggle. Because, we will, because if we can't find Scripture, a lot of times we'll just go purely based off what we want, but we do always have to remember what drives our normal decision-making process is not Scripture. Our normal way of functioning is what we see, what feels good, and what are we want. That's our, that's our operating operating system. So we always have to be at least aware of that. Yes, we have to be aware that there's this sinful nature working in me and making my decisions. Sometimes it's not the best, is it? Does that make sense? Now, any questions about that? Now, what I want you to see is I'm going to take those words that they use, and I think in a way that's very damaging, but I want to make it work in a more biblically-minded way. All right? So, let's go through this. First, discernment is based on God's word alone, right? And that requires a correct understanding of it. So, our discernment is critical. Our ability to understand God's word will determine the quality of our discernment. Yes? A lack of understanding of scripture will lead to Bad discernment. Because have you not heard people quote scripture to try to justify a decision? And you're like, what are you talking about? Like, you just like, give me your Bible. Just, you just don't ever touch it again. And just, here, just become an atheist because I don't know what you're doing. Because, I mean, because bad things happen. People have used the Bible to justify murder, slavery, rape, Some horrible things. All right? So your discernment is based off the quality and how you handle it. Now, people's misuse of it doesn't mean this is bad. It means our misuse of it. We just got to make sure we don't misuse it. All right? So we got to get this down. All right? Now, how does discernment, how does conviction connect to discernment? 
Well, there's two kind. When you look up the word conviction, there's two definitions. One is being convicted. Uh, in other words, you have a firmly held belief or opinion. You are convicted that this is right, that something is true. And the other is being convicted about something being wrong. There's two ways of looking at conviction. Does that make sense? All right. So this is how it works. When we discern what God's word says, when we discern what it says by properly understanding it, one, there should be a conviction because we know we fall short of it in some way, shape, or form. Agreed. It should lead to conviction. The study of God's word should always be convicted because we are looking at things that are not our ways, but his ways, not my thoughts, but his thoughts, his righteousness, not my righteousness, right? Because I don't know about you, over and over and over when I study the Bible, I find that it goes against what I want. I don't always like that. But I'm convicted by the fact that I'm in conflict with it. I'm in conflict with it all the time. I don't understand it. Right? Does that make sense? Right? But I am also convicted, because I believe it's the word of God, that this is the right thing to do. This is truth. So discernment leads to a conviction that I don't follow it and a conviction and a firmly held belief that it is true. So discernment, what flows from it? Conviction. Now, where does faith come into play? All right, this is what we're going to end with. And this, we're not going to be able to get to character, but I'll be talking about it this week because we're in Exodus 34 this week for the Bible study exercise. But faith, oh boy. And I'll be talking about this one as well because I still got to work through the curriculum on it because they do weird things with it. All right, now this is going to make a lot of people mad, but that's okay. All right. Back when uh, Bart Ehrman uh, debated... Think Dr. I think it's Dr. Wallace at Dallas Theological Seminary many 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 years ago, and I took uh, we took the teenagers to the debate. All right, because that's what our church does. We don't take teenagers to do anything fun. We take them to a scholarly debate <laughs> among Bart Ehrman and Dr. Wallace over basically the Word of God being inspired. Now I know Bart Ehrman very 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 well. He's a skeptic. He doesn't, you know, he rejects Christianity, but he's very knowledgeable. And I told everyone Bart Ehrman's going to win the debate. Bart Ehrman's going to win the debate. There's just no way, no how. It's ridiculous, right? One because I just know debate and I know how it works. Because here's what Christians try to say: It's like I'm going to debate this atheist, I'm going to debate this agnostic, and I'm going to prove in my thesis for the debate that the Bible is the inspired, inerrant, perfect Word of God. Well, guess what? All Bart Ehrman has to do. He just brings up the fact that there are more textual variants in the manuscripts than there are words in the Bible. He can point out the different textual variants, which changes the entire meaning of the text in some cases. He can show you that in most manuscripts, the woman caught in adultery doesn't even appear. And so some believe the story shouldn't even be in there. There are other arguments about in 1 John, where the three, there's, there's three that bear witness. They're like that doesn't, There's all these issues, and everyone knows that these textual variants, I mean, anyone who knows the Bible knows how it works, right? Even the formation of the canon is even kind of questionable, right? Who formed the canon? Man! So if they formed the canon, why can't I form a new one? That, that causes problems, Right? I mean, it causes problems. So we can go on and on and on. There's a, because the Bible didn't fall from heaven bound in leather with a table of contents. There were letters circulating all over the place. The shepherd of Hermas, most people believed it belonged in the canon. The Didache, some people believed it belonged in the canon. Others believe Revelation and James should be thrown out. There was all kinds of debates. So you get, so we went to, and I told everyone, if Ehrman's going to win the debate. It's just, you cannot get, you cannot prove what we're claiming to, what we can prove. We can't. Now, people get nervous when I say that. Let me explain. As Christians, utilizing manuscript evidence, archaeological evidence, historical evidence, we believe we can prove that the Bible is a historical document that is extremely reliable, that has more manuscript evidence than pretty much any other work of antiquity. That sounds good. But how far does that get us? 
Where does that get us? Not all the way to proving that it's inspired and God breathed, does it? It proved that it's a historically reliable document with a lot of manuscript evidence that puts it in a cl- class different than other works. So then how do we get from there to believing that it's the inspired and errant word of God? Faith. An element of faith has to come in. Look at Hebrews 11. Everybody knows Hebrews 11. 1. Hebrews 11, 1, that's, the, that's what the curriculum used for this week. What does Hebrews 11, 1 says? Faith, substance of the things hoped for, and the evidence of things not seen. In other words, faith grabs on to what we can't see, to what we cannot necessarily 100% prove. So discernment, we see what it says, Right? Does the Bible say that it's inspired? Yes. Does that Greek word mean God breathed? Yes. Right? Agreed? That the word of God is perfect, purified, that we tr- it's trustworthy. Yeah, that's what it says. I discern what it says. I am convicted that it is true, and I'm convicted that, oh, wow, it's God's word, and look at how I treat it. Now, faith comes into play that by faith, I believe and trust that it is the inerrant word of God because evidence cannot get me there. Does that make sense? My discernment leads to conviction and conviction ultimately requires faith because that conviction can only get me so far. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now I can look at different scientific arguments that may call into question the evolutionary theory. Yes? Yes? I may be able to challenge some of that. I may be able to challenge it from a philosophical, logical argument, right? Because either in the beginning you have matter or in the beginning you have God. In the beginning you have matter and on one Tuesday at three o'clock it blew up and now there's people. I have a hard time with that. And, or in the beginning there's a God who spoke everything into existence. Now other people have a problem with that. Now, because of my discernment, I discern from God's word that there is a creator that he created and I'm convicted that it's true. Faith can only get me where? I mean, evidence can only get me where? It can only get me so far. And I can call into question what? The other, but it doesn't get me all the way to there is a creator and he is identified in the Bible and he's the right. It requires Faith. There's a level of faith. Christians don't like that, but it's just, we, we want to believe that we just have the evidence and we can just prove everyone wrong. We can have evidence that gets us so far. There is an element of faith. There's a, in fact, look at Hebrews 11. I think it's verse 2. Does it not talk about creation? I think it's verse 2. Verse 3, what does it say? Yeah, by faith. We understand that the world was created by God's command. I can't, there's no way scientifically to prove that God spoke it into existence. There's no way. And we think, well, I can come up with some evidences that call into question evolution. That doesn't prove God spoke it into existence. You're just arguing that there are certain things that call into question the evolutionary view. That's not positive evidence. Does that make sense? Requires faith. Requires faith. So discernment leads to conviction, and conviction must be followed by faith to hold that it's true. I'll give you a, one more example about faith. And this one makes everyone uncomfortable, but that's okay. All right. What do, what do I always say is the most troubling verse in the entire Bible? Genesis 1.1. Why is it the most troubling verse in the entire Bible to me? Because how, why would an all-powerful, all-knowing, Sovereign God create a world where there's pain, suffering, death, rape, molestation, abuse, and all the other horrible, 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 horrible things that happen. I struggle with that. Discernment tells me God did create it, and that's who God is. I'm convicted that that's true. By faith, I accept that that's the fact. Do I like it? Do not. I do not like it. And that dislike leads me to lots of problems, lots of struggles. And whenever I mention these, people get mad at me, but that's okay. Let me explain. All right. 
horrible tragedy takes place. Now, the Bible, by discernment, tells me to pray without ceasing. That when you pray, not if you pray. So the Bible seems to imply that I should pray. Right? Now, here's, I'm just going to be honest with you, okay? Are you ready? I'm going to say this in church. I have a hard time. You know why I have a hard time? Hey, pastor, this horrible tragedy, I need you to pray. Okay. So let me get this right. You want me to pray to the God who allowed it, who didn't stop it, to do what now? I have a hard time. I, I, I know people got, it gets real quiet. But I'm just being honest. If I use my brain, does that make any sense? Right? Like, if I found Sarah in the back in the library, she's got one of the teenagers, she's over there just beating them down, beating them down. I'm like, well, this is a horrible situation. This is a, what, what should we do? And they're like, well, pray to Sarah. that she, She's the one doing it. Right? Hopefully y'all would be like, get someone else. Don't talk to her. Right? Go do something. That's hard to wrap your mind around, right? I I know it makes us all uncomfortable. I know we get nervous. But look, I've had to process this my whole Christian life, right? Right? I mean, this was hard for me, right? Standing at my mother's grave, Buffalo Gap Cemetery. Everybody's walking up going, you know, all things work together for good. God loves you and everything's going to be great. And you just pray about the sin. You want me to pray about what? You want me to pray to the God who, who let my mom die? That, that's what you want me to do? How about you get out of my face? That's pretty much was my attitude. Why don't all Christians stop talking to me? Because all of you are garbage. That's pretty much was my attitude. Now, I'm not saying that ended up in a good way because then I tried to kill myself in eight weeks in a psychiatric hospital. So I didn't say that my solution was much better, but I didn't have a lot of good answers. That's hard to process, isn't it? I just just read an article and uh, there was some pastor. Someone came into the church with a hammer and attacked the pastor with a hammer, right? And so the, the person writing the thing was, he, he was trying to process all the, the Christians' response, right? Like, pray for the pastor. And the guy writing the article was like, you're going to pray to the God who let him get hit in the head with a hammer? Where is the God you're praying for? He let it happen. And when I read the article, I'm like, dude, I understand where you're coming from. That's hard. Because discernment tells me what? What does discernment tell, tells me? There is a God. He's all omni and knows the beginning. Omniscient from the end. He knows all things. Okay. I then can see what happened. I know from discernment that the Bible seems to say praying is an acceptable thing to do and it's a good thing to do and we're supposed to do it, right? Right? All right, well, how do I reconcile that? Can I reconcile that? Now, you can try to give me every Christian answer that you've ever learned or try to give, give it. I don't understand the book of Job. That book makes absolutely no sense to me. Does, it, does the book of Job bother anybody else? Job was just minding his own business, right? He's just chilling out, hanging out with his family. He's got money. He's got cattle. Everything's good. Everything's wonderful. I know what's, what's happening behind the scenes. Satan comes walking in, and God's like, I just heard a sermon last night that said, you know, Satan brought, brought up Job. Look, what, do you not know how to read? Who brought up Job? God. Hey, have you considered my servant? Now, wh- why would God bring it up? Did he know what was going to happen? Oh, yeah, he knew what was going to happen. And then what did he do? He said, Sure. Everybody's like, well, he did it for Job's good. Yeah, not so much good for his kids. 
or servants, or everyone else who died. Like, everybody's like, he did, it, all things work together for good, not for the dead kids. And I don't know how good it is for you. I don't know. If I lose my kids, but I guess later on I get some new kids, well, the new kids have to be better than the old kids, so I'm glad all the, I, I don't think it really works out that way, does it? Everyone, everyone so messes that story up. That story is horrible to understand. So what's our takeaway from it? What, what's our takeaway from it? There you go. Right. That there is a God. I can discern who he is and his character, but I will never understand through all the human reasoning and trying to figure out sometimes what he does. I will never understand it. So what, where, where, so now where does faith come into play? I, I just have to be, I just, that faith, I've got to accept something by faith that I don't understand. Because faith is grasping onto what I don't understand, what I don't see. Faith is believe, I don't, I don't understand a lot of this. I can discern, and when I say I don't understand it, I can discern what it says. I can be convicted by it. But it requires faith in order to do what? To embrace it or to grab onto it. And that's not easy. Right? It's like, uh, I think it was in the movie uh, Rudy. I think it was in the movie Rudy. But uh, the, the Catholic priest says, there's only two things I know for sure. There is a God and I'm not him. Because the, the, if you know the story, Rudy was trying to get to play for Notre Dame and everything in life says he shouldn't even be on a football field, right? He was like five foot, 50 pounds, like he should never play. And uh, he kept trying and trying and trying and trying and trying. He had to do everything, he had to go to other schools, try to get that, because he couldn't get the grades to get into D- Notre Dame. And then even if he got into Notre Dame, then he ended up on the practice field. He's getting destroyed every, but he's like, he's never going to play, never going to play. Finally, his career's about up. And basically it was the other players were like, let Rudy play, let him play, or we're going to all sit out. And he gets to play like one or two plays and they make a whole movie about it. It's an amazing story. I, I don't know why you would go through all of that to play one or two plays, but okay. But the point is, is he could not, he kept praying for God to do something and he couldn't understand it. So that's why the priest was like, look, I, I don't have any answers for you. There's a God. I'm not him. We can discern. Amen. When we're making our decisions, we look at what God directly says and we look at the principles. From this, we get a conviction that it is true. But it only gets us where? So far. And then we have to believe by faith. I'm not saying that faith is completely blind, because I do believe it's based off lots of evidence. Yes? Like, I can, be- I can have evidence to say that the tomb was empty. Everyone seems to agree that the tomb was empty. Even the enemies agreed the tomb was empty. Right? Right? I can, I can try to argue that something happened because those people who were scared were now preaching in Jerusalem. But what can I not dogmatically 100% prove? That Jesus rose from the dead and ascended to the right hand of the Father. I have to believe that by faith. Evidence gets me the tomb was empty. Some, everyone changed dramatically. They, they confessed that it was empty. I can discern that from what? The text. Faith has to say, he rose, from the, he rose the third day, ascended to the right hand of the Father, and from there he will come to judge living and the dead. I can't see him. Faith is the assurance of what I cannot see. Faith is the assurance that God is doing something, though I don't understand it. So discernment, cannot be this wishy-washy, mystical thing. People make horrible decisions that way. We have God's word. We have to understand it. That requires our work. When we look at situations, does it address it? Is there a principle? I am convicted by that, that I don't live up to it, and that it's true. And then that gets me up to a point that at some point I have to embrace what God's word says by faith. Because reason can only get you 
so far. You say, well, why does God make it about faith? I wish it was. I don't know. Ask God why. I wish there wasn't a faith element. Job had, had to have faith, did he not? He didn't understand a clue what was going on. He didn't understand. And did he ever get any answers? That's the, my favorite part of Job. He just gets questions, no answers. We don't like that. A lot of times when I pose questions, you guys want to give answers. Sometimes I'm asking the question to try to demonstrate to you there isn't a good answer, <laughs> but you want the answer, right? And then y'all say, I always leave there with more questions than answers. Take your complaint up with Job, right? He didn't get any, isn't that messed up? We get to read. We know what's going on. We're like, God's, he's just like, I don't know what happened. I, I wanted to die. And then I ask God a couple of questions and then I get hit with a. And then I'm like, okay, I'm just going to shut up. The end. He's like, Can you imagine Job years later? Like, I don't know what happened. It was just bad. Everything, people started dying. Things started burning up. And I tried to ask God and I still don't have the answers to the question. I still don't know what happened. Now, maybe once he died and entered into God's presence, maybe then it made sense. The rest of the time, how do you have to understand it? Faith. And does faith always make it easy? Does not. There's a million things in my life that I still don't understand. And I'll never understand it. Now, if I abandon faith, what am I left with? I'm still left with, please, please understand, if you abandon faith, you're still left with a million questions, right? I mean, like, so wait, everything just blew up and I'm here and there's no purpose, there's no meaning in life? Why do I even exist? Like, there's question after question after question after question. I, I don't even have all the answers to those questions. Like, no matter which system you go in, at least I don't have the answers, but I know the ultimate cause, this, there's just no rhyme, reason, explanation, purpose, meaning, nothing. It's just, I don't, know, I don't even have the ability to say what's right and what's wrong because there's no standard of right and wrong other than what I, it's just insane, it's just chaos. So both, both systems leave you messed up. But please don't fall into the Christian world of all this subjective feeling, trying to figure out what God's telling you to do. Open up your Bible. Does it directly address it? Is there a principle? Be convicted by that and then believe by faith and then use common sense to make the rest of your decisions. There you go. Let's pray. Lord God, we come before you this afternoon. This has been a very important subject, at least to me, because of the struggles I've had in my own life trying to make decisions and making them based off really flawed understanding. And Lord, I have struggled in my own life with understanding and believing what you're doing and why you're doing it. But that's the life that we are called to. Help us embrace the mystery and the faith that's required for us to make it through this life. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And God's people said,